Part two of the Praise of Folly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. The Praise of Folly by Desiderius Erasmus, translated by John Wilson. Part two. And now let him that will compare the benefits they receive by me with the metamorphoses of the gods, of whom I shall not mention what they have done in their pettish humours, but where they have been most favourable turning one into a tree, another into a bird, a third into a grasshopper, serpent, or the like, as if there were any difference between perishing and being another thing. But I restore the same man to the best and happiest part of his life. And if men would but refrain from all commerce with wisdom, and give up themselves to be governed by me, they should never know what it were to be old, but solace themselves with a perpetual youth." Do but observe our grim philosophers that are perpetually beating their brains on knotty subjects, and for the most part you'll find them grown old before they are scarcely young. And whence is it but that their continual and restless thoughts insensibly prey upon their spirits and dry up their radical moisture? Whereas, on the contrary, my fat fools are as plump and round as a Westphalian hog, and never sensible of old age, unless, perhaps, as sometimes it rarely happens, they come to be infected with wisdom, so hard a thing it is for a man to be happy in all things. And to this purpose is that no small testimony of the proverb that says, Folly is the only thing that keeps youth at a stay and old age afar off, and that is verified in the Brabanders, of whom there goes this common saying, that age which is wont to render other men wiser makes them the greater fools. And yet there is scarce any nation of a more jocund converse or that is less sensible of the misery of old age than they are. And to these, as in situation, so for manner of living, come nearest my friends the Hollanders. And why should I not call them mine, since they are so diligent observers of me, that they are commonly called by my name? Of which they are so far from being ashamed, they rather pride themselves in it. Let the foolish world then be packing and seek out Medeas, Kirkis, Venuses, Auroras, and I know not what other fountains of restoring youth. I am sure I am the only person that both can and have made it good. Tis I alone that have that wonderful juice with which Memnon's daughter prolonged the youth of her grandfather Tython. I am that Venus by whose favour Phaon became so young again that Sappho fell in love with him. Mine are those herbs, if yet there be any such, Mind those charms, and mind that fountain that not only restores departed youth, but, which is more desirable, preserves it perpetual. And if you all subscribe to this opinion, that nothing is better than youth, or more execrable than age, I conceive you cannot but see how much you are indebted to me, that have retained so great a good, and shut out so great an evil. But why do I altogether spend my breath in speaking of mortals? View heaven round, and let him that will reproach me with my name, if he find any one of the gods that were not stinking and contemptible, were he not made acceptable by my deity. Why is it that Bacchus is always a stripling and bushy-haired, but because he is mad and drunk and spends his life in drinking, dancing, revels and may-games, not having so much as the least society with Pallas? And lastly, he is so far from desiring to be accounted wise, that he delights to be worshipped with sports and gambles. Nor is he displeased with a proverb that gave him the surname of Fool, a greater fool than Bacchus, which name of his was changed to Morikos, for that sitting before the gates of his temple the wanton country people were wont to bedaub him with new wine and figs. And of scoffs what not have not the ancient comedies thrown on him? O oh, foolish God, say they, and worthy to be born as you were of your father's thigh, and yet who had not rather be your fool and sot, always merry, ever young, and making sport for other people, than either Homer's Jupiter, with his crooked counsels, terrible to every one, or old Pan, with his hubbubs, or smutty Vulcan, half covered with cinders, or even Pallas herself, so dreadful with her gorgon's head and spear and a countenance like bull-beef. Why is Cupid always portrayed like a boy, but because he is a very wag, and can neither do nor so much as think of anything sober? Why Venus ever in her prime, but because of her affinity with me? 
witness that colour of her hair so resembling my father from when she is called the golden venus and lastly ever laughing if you give any credit to the poets or their followers the statuaries what deity did the romans ever more religiously adore than that of flora the founders of all pleasure nay if you should but diligently serve the lives of the most sour and morose of the gods out of homer and the rest of the poets you would find them all but so many pieces of folly and to what purpose should i run over any of the other gods tricks when you know enough of jupiter's loose loves when that chaste diana shall so far forget her sex as to be ever hunting and ready to perish for endymion but i had rather they should hear these things from momus from whom heretofore they were wont to have their shares till in one of their angry humours they tumbled him together with eighty goddess of mischief down headlong to the earth because his wisdom forsooth unseasonably disturbed their happiness nor since that dares any mortal give him harbour though i must confess there wanted little but that he had been received into the courts of princes had not my companion flattery reigned in chief there with whom and the other there is no more correspondence than between lambs and wolves from whence it is that the gods play the fool with a greater liberty and more content to themselves doing all things carelessly as says father homer that is to say without any one to correct them for what ridiculous stuff is there which that stump of the fig-tree priapus does not afford them what tricks and leisure domains with which mercury does not cloak his thefts what buffoonery that vulcan is not guilty of while one with his polt foot another with his smutched muzzle another with his impertinencies he makes sport for the rest of the gods as also that old selenus with his country dances polyphemus footing time to his cyclops hammers the nymphs with their jigs and satyrs with their antics while pan makes them all twitter with some coarse ballad which yet they had rather hear than the muses themselves and chiefly when they are all well witted with nectar besides what should i mention that these gods do when they are half drunk now by my troth so foolish that i myself can hardly refrain laughter but in these matters to a better remembered harpocrates lest some eavesdropping god or other take us whispering that which momus only has the privilege of speaking at length and therefore according to homer's example i think it high time to leave the gods to themselves and look down a little on the earth wherein likewise you'll find nothing frolic or fortunate that it owes not to me so provident has that great parent of mankind nature been that there should not be anything without its mixture and as it were seasoning of folly for since according to the definition of the stoics wisdom is nothing else than to be governed by reason and on the contrary folly to be given up to the will of our passions that the life of man might not be altogether disconsolate and hard to away with of how much more passion than reason as jupiter composed us putting in as one would say scarce half an ounce to a pound besides he has confined reason to a narrow corner of the brain and left all the rest of the body to our passions has also set up against this one two as it were masterless tyrants anger that possesses the region of the heart and consequently the very fountain of life the heart itself and lust that stretches its empire everywhere against which double force how powerful reason is let common experience declare inasmuch as she which yet is all she can do may call out to us till she be hoarse again and tell us the rules of honesty and virtue while they give up the reins to their governor and make a hideous clamour till at last being wearied he suffer himself to be carried whither they please to hurry him but forasmuch as such as are born to the business of the world have some little sprinklings of reason more than the rest yet that they may the better manage it even in this as well as in other things they call me to counsel and i give them such as is worthy of myself to wit that they take to them a wife a silly thing god wot and foolish yet wanton and pleasant by which means the roughness of the masculine temper is seasoned and sweetened by her folly for in that plato seems to doubt under what genus he should put woman to wit that of rational creatures or brutes he intended no other in it than to show the apparent folly of the sex for if perhaps any of them goes about to be thought wiser than the rest what else does she do but play the fool twice as if a man should teach a cow to dance 
a thing quite against the hair. For, as it doubles the crime, if any one should put a disguise upon nature, or endeavour to bring her to that she will in no wise bear, according to that proverb the Greeks, an ape is an ape, though clad in scarlet, so a woman is a woman still, that is to say, foolish, let her put on whatever visit she please. But, by the way, I hope that sex is not so foolish as to take offence at this, that I myself, being a woman, and folly too, have attributed folly to them. For if they weigh it right, they needs must acknowledge that they owe it to folly that they are more fortunate than men. As first their beauty, which, and that not without cause, they prefer before everything, since by its means they exercise a tyranny even upon tyrants themselves. Otherwise, whence proceeds that sour look, rough skin, bushy beard, and such other things as speak plain old age in a man, but from that disease of wisdom? Whereas women's cheeks are ever plump and smooth, their voice small, their skin soft, as if they imitated a certain kind of perpetual youth. Again, what greater thing do they wish in their whole lives than that they may please the man? For to what other purpose are all those dresses, washes, baths, slops, perfumes, and those several little tricks of setting their faces, painting their eyebrows, and smoothing their skins? And now tell me, what higher letters of recommendation have they to men than this folly? For what is it they do not permit them to do? And to what other purpose than that of pleasure? wherein yet their folly is not the least thing that pleases, which so true it is, I think no one will deny, that does but consider with himself what foolish discourse and odd gambles pass between a man and this woman, as often as he had a mind to be gamesome. And so I have shown you whence the first and chiefest delight of man's life springs. But there are some, you'll say, and those too, none of the youngest, that have a greater kindness for the pot and the petticoat, and place their chiefest pleasure in good fellowship. If there can be any great entertainment without a woman at it, let others look to it. This, I am sure, there was never any pleasant which folly gave not the relish to, insomuch that if they find no occasion of laughter, they send for one that may make it, or hire some buffoon flatterer, whose ridiculous discourse may put by the gravity of the company. For to what purpose were it to clog our stomachs with dainties, junkets, and the like stuff, unless our eyes and ears, nay, whole mind, were likewise entertained with jests, merriments, and laughter. But of these kind of second courses I am the only cook, though yet those ordinary practices of our feasts, as choosing a king, throwing dice, drinking health, trolling it round, dancing the cushion and the like, were not invented by the seven wise men, but myself, and that too for the common pleasure of mankind." The nature of all which things is such that the more of folly they have, the more they conduce to human life, which, if it were unpleasant, did not deserve the name of life, and other than such it could not well be, did not these kind of diversions wipe away tediousness, next cousin to the other. But perhaps there are some that neglect this way of pleasure, and rest satisfied in the enjoyment of their friends, calling friendship the most desirable of all things more necessary than either air, fire, or water, so delectable that he that shall take it out of the world had as good put out the sun, and lastly, so commendable, if yet that make anything to the matter, that neither the philosophers themselves doubted to reckon it among their chiefest good. But what if I show you that I am both the beginning and end of this so great good also? Nor shall I go about to prove it by fallacies, sorites, dilemmas, or other the like subtleties of logicians, but after my blunt way point out the thing as clearly as it were with my finger. And now tell me if to wink, slip over, be blind at, or deceived in the vices of our friends, nay, to admire and esteem them for virtues, be not at least the next degree to folly. What is it when one kisses his mistress' freckle neck, another the wart on her nose? when a father shall swear his squint-eyed child is more lovely than Venus. What is this, I say, but mere folly? And so, perhaps, you'll cry it is, and yet tis this only that joins friends together, and continues them so joined. I speak of ordinary men, of whom none are born without their imperfections, and happy is he that is pressed with the least. For among wise princes there is either no friendship at all, 
or if there be, it is unpleasant and reserved, and that too, but among a very few, to a crime to say none. For that the greatest part of mankind are fools, nay, there is not any one that dotes not in many things, and friendship, you know, is seldom made but among equals. And yet, if it should so happen that there were a mutual good will between them, it is in no wise firm nor very long lived, that is to say, among such as are morose and more circumspect than needs, as being eagle-sighted into his friend's faults, but so blear-eyed to their own, that they take not the least notice of the wallet that hangs behind their own shoulders. Since, then, the nature of man is such that there is scarce any one to be found that is not subject to many errors, add to this the great diversity of minds and studies, so many slips, oversights, and chances of human life, and how is it possible there should be any true friendship between those Argus so much as one hour, were it not for that which the Greeks excellently call Euathean? And you may render by folly or good nature. Choose you whether. But what? Is not the author and parent of all our love, Cupid, as blind as a beetle? And as with him all colours agree, so from him is it that every one likes his own sweeter kin best though never so ugly, and that an old man dotes on his old wife, and a boy on his girl. These things are not only done everywhere, but laughed at too. Yet, as ridiculous as they are, they make society pleasant, and, as it were, glue it together. And what has been said of friendship may more reasonably be presumed of matrimony, which in truth is no other than an inseparable conjunction of life. Good God! What divorces, or what not worse than that, would daily happen were not the converse between a man and his wife supported and cherished by flattery, apishness, gentleness, ignorance, dissembling, certain retainers of mine also? Whoop holiday! How few marriages should we have if the husband should but thoroughly examine how many tricks his pretty little mob of modesty has played before she was married! and how fewer of them would hold together did not most of the wife's actions escape the husband's knowledge, through his neglect or sottishness. And for this also you are beholden to me, by whose means it is that the husband is pleasant to his wife, the wife to her husband, and the house kept in quiet. A man is laughed at when, seeing his wife weeping, he licks up her tears. But how much happier is it to be thus deceived than by being troubled with jealousy, not only to torment himself, but set all things in a hubbub. In fine, I am so necessary to the making of all society and manner of life, both delightful and lasting, that neither would the people long endure their governors, nor the servant his master, nor the master his footman, nor the scholar his tutor, nor one friend another, nor the wife her husband, nor the usurer the borrower, nor a soldier his commander, nor one companion another, unless all of them had their interchangeable failings, one while flattering, other while prudently conniving, and generally sweeting one another with some small relish of folly. And now you'd think I'd said all, but you shall hear yet greater things. Will he, I pray, love any one that hates himself, or ever agree with another who is not at peace with himself, or beget pleasure in another that is troublesome to himself? I think no one will say it that is not more foolish than folly. And yet, if you should exclude me, there is no man but would be so far from enduring another that he would stink in his own nostrils, be nauseated by his own actions, and himself become odious to himself. For as much as nature, in too many things rather a stepdame than a parent to us, has imprinted that evil in men, especially such as have least judgment, that every one repents him of his own condition and admires that of others. Whence it comes to pass that all her gifts, elegancy, and graces corrupt and perish. For what benefit is beauty, the greatest blessing of heaven, if it be mixed with affectation? What youth, if corrupted with the severity of old age? Lastly, what is that in the whole business of a man's life he can do with any grace to himself or others? For it is not so much a thing of art as the very life of every action that it be done with a good mean, unless this my friend and companion, self-love, be present with it. Nor does she without cause supply me the place of a sister, since her whole endeavours are to act my part everywhere. 
for what is more foolish than for a man to study nothing else than how to please himself, to make himself the object of his own admiration? And yet, what is there that is either delightful or taking, nay, rather, what not the contrary, that a man does against the hair? Take away this salt of life, and the orator may even sit still with his action. The musician, with all his division, will be able to please no man. The player be hissed off the stage, the poet and all his muses ridiculous, the painter with his art contemptible, and the physician with all his slip-slops go a-begging. Lastly, you will be taken for an ugly fellow instead of youthful, and a beast instead of a wise man, a child instead of eloquent, and instead of a well-bred man a clown. So necessary a thing it is that every one flatter himself and commend himself to himself before he can be commended by others. Lastly, since it is the chief point of happiness that a man is willing to be what he is, you have further abridged in this my self-love that no man is ashamed of his own face, no man of his own wit, no man of his own parentage, no man of his own house, no man of his manner of living, nor any man of his own country, so that a highlander has no desire to change with an Italian, a Thracian with an Athenian, nor a Scythian for the fortunate islands. Oh, the singular care of nature that in so great a variety of things has made all equal! Where she has been sometimes sparing of her gifts, she has recompensed it with a more of self-love. Though here, I must confess, I speak foolishly, it being the greatest of all other her gifts, to say nothing that no great action was ever attempted without my motion, or art brought to perfection without my help. End of Part 2